Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Delivery Layer podcast, where we've got David Kidder on the show. He is an incredible entrepreneur, and he's got a lot of great context and great advice and thoughts on what it takes to start a data business and how, what it takes to start a business in general. David and I have known each other for many years. I used to work at a company that just started called Bionic, and I'm excited to share this episode with you. So with that, let's jump in. Welcome, David Kidder, to the Delivery Layer podcast. So excited to have you. And I will let you introduce yourself in just a minute. But for everyone else who's listening, David is the is the founder of a, a company called Bionic, which was bought by Accenture, where I used to work. And a large portion of what I know about building new products and developing products came from David and his wisdom. And so I'm extremely happy to have him on the on the show. David, do you want to give sort of a little bit of your background and your career background before we jump into a very fun discussion? Yes. Well, first, it's, it's an absolute honor to be with you here today. And I'm just thrilled for what you're doing and who you've become, as I like to refer to. And I feel also a lot of pressure. I mean, I, I, now the company has to work, right? right? So no, I just very briefly, I've been the founder and CEO of uh, four companies of the last 25 years. I'm 50 and three venture backed kind of software services company all through exit and really two really worked and two didn't. So they were across the finish line. I've been through all the highs and lows and the, the good outcomes and also the kind of soul crushing failure where you lie on the ground literally and cry. So, and then I, my personal life, married three boys, all teenagers, and I've done about a hundred angel investments over the last 17 years and written a bunch of books about mindset and startups and stuff. So happy to share and go anywhere you want to go on this journey because it's a lot of fun and kind of crazy. So cool. Well, I want to cover both the sort of tactical side of sort of product development and data and all of that. And then also some of the more, you know, mindset oriented stuff that actually makes a huge difference when you're going through some of these challenging situations inside a company or at a startup, because you have them with both. And so one thing that I'll share with uh, everyone before I jump into the first question, just so that they have some additional context is that Bionic, which was the company that I worked at that got bought by Accenture is like focused on going into really big companies and helping them start new initiatives. And so David, why don't you give a little bit of background about sort of Bionic and Accenture Song and the kind of work that you do in inside those big companies and how you help them start new things and I think that's going to give some great context for the advice in the in the conversation that we'll have next. Yeah, so I think there's sort of four seats at the table we can kind of focus on. So think of them as sort of there's the perspective of the experience and then there's the sort of perception of all of growth, like as you back up and consider all the seats. So one of the seats is a founder, right? And building a company through those trials and raising money and growing and selling. The other one is as an investor, right? You invest in 10 companies, you know, everything's new. You rest in, you rest in 90 or 100, you see a lot of things that are very common. You kind of develop sort of like that blank ability to see what what's going to work and not going to work and the correlations. And that's another seat. The other one is as a writer in curious, you know, sort of leader in, in, in how to think in this space. And the other one is just working directly with a CEO who's trying to either ignite growth or navigate through very challenging times in some of the biggest companies in the world. So as you sit as a advisor and investor, as a founder, and as a a writer, you get to see things from a lot of, a lot of perspectives. And there's a huge difference between kind of working in a company to do that and working on the company in all those dimensions. And so not to make something too complex, but you know there are some major macro themes that whether you sit in any one of those seats, the conditions for success is are truths, I think. And you know, building a company is wonderful, but you also have to understand the conditions by which a company can be successful in the marketplace, in the leader, in leadership, in the company, and in in your mindset. And so we can talk about any one of those dimensions because they're really all very interesting. That's cool. Well, let's just jump in and we'll kind of probably span across multiple of them. So when, when, because most of the people that are listening to this are data people or data leaders. Mm -hmm. And Obviously, data has had 
such a growing impact on the way that companies operate and frankly can the way that companies build products over the last decade and so the data people the the data teams and the data people are oftentimes a part of that process not necessarily understanding in the same way that a founder would that you're that you're building a new business building a new capability so i, I guess First big question, and we can kind of see where we go with it. You know, what do companies get the most wrong when they're building new products? And what are some of the things that data people who are in that effort of building new products should be thinking about and should be doing, but that typically they're not? Well, let me just say this up front is that I know your background and, and how special you are to these exact questions. So my background as a founder, as as to some degree, the application layer of product development, I'm not like a technical data person, but I do understand how to build businesses that leverage data. And so that's the really perspective I'm, I'm coming from. And by the way, the products that matter to, to actual users. So, the, the, you know, in the, in the sort of continuum of my career, going from the dawn of the internet and through some major milestones of the highs and lows of that through now, as we're, I am now just the last two years kind of getting smart on the transformer era, sort of going from data warehousing to data insights to now a, a transforming moment. And all the sort of, you know, structured to unstructured to neural networks, all these, the moment that's sort of like changing what data can be. That I still think one of the primary questions to ask about value of data is what is the question? And that sounds sort of cartoonishly simple, but if you want to, build a great company or get more value out of data in this case is you should spend time really, really thinking deeply about asking a better question of it. Cause it's still, it was inherently dumb, right? Data is dumb until you can ask it a question and get something from it. And now data is becoming intelligent. It's sort of like, it's like what water is to the body, to the asking the body to do something right. You know, it used to be trapped and now it's in the system and we can start doing uh, creating more life out of it, more engendered life out of it. And so to create more engendered life, we have to ask it really profound questions. And I think, you know, from, from a user perspective, getting really good at prompt engineering is sort of the ready right, vanguard of sort of the commodity understanding of that. But, you know, for big companies, data is supposed to be instructive. It's supposed to solve inherent problems, you know, predictively, hopefully, but, looking forward as opposed to not always looking back and also create meaning from it. So for example, like, you know, you ask three different stakeholders inside of an organization about the data and their interpretation of it, the questions they ask, and their view of that data could be a post. Like, so an arrow up might be, we're spending money. We're going to continue to spend. <laughs> and that same arrow up to the, to someone on the product side, maybe we need to stop spending, for example. So, Asking the right question and getting the right context for the stakeholder, the customer, inside or outside the company has radical implications for the value of how we construct data and create meaning from it. So okay, very high level, but I think it's still the core of this we still struggle with is asking really good questions and making sure we productize them to the actual stakeholder who understand, has to understand it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And to the, to the broader point, and I know one of your, your books, you know, new to big and, and the sort of like product development philosophy is step number one, validate the customer problem, right? Like, is that a real problem that you're solving? Is that a real thing that someone needs to, needs your data to fix? Or is that not a real problem? And if you don't do good validation on that, then you're not going to be able to build a good business on top of that foundation. Yeah, I mean, you could also change what, you know, the, because language matters. Like, I mean, sometimes as a thought experiment, changing or repurposing or shifting what we perceive to be value of data is really important. So if you just replace the word data with product, right? Yeah. Just to reframe it so we don't get, we kind of go from like the oasis of meaning of what data is to an actual thing, the actual arrow, the actual container of the value it's still productization of, of insight or knowledge or decisions, right? Because you could try to make a decision from this. So a product needs to produce a decision or an action. So 
if you want them to act and they're not getting value out of the action of the product slash data, you haven't built anything of meaning. And they and it's that classic what you know, what where is what is the commercial truth? And the commercial truth only lives in high fidelity signals, which is they actually change behavior. It's they it's that we jokingly say, and we actually you know jokingly we say it's the do versus say, right? What do they do? And you know, that I could go back to my little flimsy example of the of the arrow. Like, does that go all the way into decision making? Does it go all the way into a high fidelity kinetic action? Not just the potential, but the kinetic of that. And your product, quote unquote product, just to reframe this, has to produce those outcomes to be to create something of value and of scale. That's really, really, really hard to do. And you can spend a lot of time moving deck chairs around your tables and never get to that level really, and understand why is no one leveraging my complexity, my, my technical interest? And it's like, because no one cares. Because there's nothing kinetic coming from it. So that's a really, as a technocrat, getting into a, a behavior game, that's the signal it has to be true. Yeah. I love it. There's zero chance that you're going to remember this, but I I still remember it because one of the things when I was interviewing at Bionic okay. and <laughs> that I obviously read your book and got a sense of sort of your philosophy and learned a lot about the Bionic process during it. And during our interview, you were looking for people that had started companies before. And before I became a data person, I started a company that totally crashed and burned for everybody that doesn't have the context on that, that it's just listening to this. It was a company called Memoir Place. And it was because I got a very meaningful memoir from my great grandfather, who was the original Solomon. And I thought, wow, this is such an amazing gift that he sort of left to his descendants and how this was right when like APIs were coming out. And so the Twilio API was out. And I thought, how cool would it be if everybody could just have a phone conversation with their older relatives that could be recorded and transcribed and you could have an audio version, you could have a book and this could be something great. And so I went out and talked to a lot of people about it. Obviously, I didn't quit my high paying finance job and all of that to go start something that I hadn't talked to people. And, and like you would expect, as I'm sure many people here would, would have that same reaction. Everybody said, wow, that's such a great idea. It sounds so meaningful. It sounds wonderful in the point that you just said before, David, but there's a difference between say versus do and, and the say versus do line is that, okay, you think this is a wonderful idea. Have you spent even a single dollar or even 10 minutes of your life like putting some sort of action behind getting a recorded story from somebody that you care about from the older generation? And overwhelmingly to that, the answer is no. And so when I... When I did my own version of starting a company, I like way over indexed on the say and had no idea about the do. And it was such a hard learned lesson. And so we talked about that during my interview at Bionic together. But it, it's just in the, one of the books I wrote, the startup playbook, there was this I, this one lens called the painkiller versus the vitamin. And you know, it's really hard to build a business. So you have to build a painkiller that scales. So once someone uses it, they never stop using it, right? You're, you're getting into, you know, oxygen and behavior that they breathe regularly as opposed to like a brand new oxygen. People don't really add new behaviors to their life very rarely. And actually, essentially, because the, uh, there's two companies, there was your company, but there's two other companies in that space. One was called uh, StoryWorth and it was called Tribute. And I, I am an investor in Tribute prior to us meeting. So like 12 years, you know, of like, Going into that journey. In fact, I talked to the founder, who's an amazing guy, yesterday. And just the journey of how to like solve for something that people are adding to their life or they 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 emotionally feel like it's a good idea, as opposed to like physically feel like they need to do it. Very different things. So it's the same. It doesn't really matter if it's a commercial product or a B2B product. That bar is still very, very high. And uh, I think it, it also in the start playbook, when I interviewed you know, Elon, who was across the couch from me at my buddy uh, Dale Ressi's home, you know, he said his best piece of advice at the time, again, this is before he was world famous, this is 12 years ago or 13 years ago, 
who sold note, of course, but who said, you know, wishful thinking is the enemy. And I realized like on the spectrum of founding companies, like you, there's like on one end of the spectrum is like pathologically optimistic. And the other end of the spectrum is like irrationally pessimistic. And so you probably wouldn't start a company if you're irrationally pessimistic, but a lot of pathologically optimistic people start um, companies because they are, they are so biased. They just ignore all the commercial truth that's just being spoken to them. They believe that future is going to be true and they're willing to bet their life on it. And more often than not, they're wrong. So in the middle of that is a rational, optimistic view of the world that keeps you going, but is based in truth. Yeah. And you have to have high fidelity truth in almost every aspect of the business from the founding to the culture, all the way down to the fidelity, of course, of the customers and how they pay. Yeah, totally. And I think in, in my data career, it, cause it, for internal, or for external data products, cause I, I spent a lot of time where data is actually the product. And, and frankly, I think that that's in the market very, it's still very nascent that companies are offering like data and insights products that aren't necessarily in that business. Like, yeah, Nielsen is offering data products, but like so many companies are sitting on valuable data that would be valuable to their customers that they don't commercialize. That's just a general theme that I think is in the market. But I think you could take the same approach internally for data work. You know, when the business leaders that you're supporting are like, deeply in pain and pulling data where it's like crucial to their day-to-day existence. And you also know when they're kind of disconnected, they're like, yeah, data, sure. We'll take this, you know, dashboard. That sounds great. And then they just keep it moving. Like you can, you can, you can physically tell the difference between whether the data is like absolutely mission critical for them to survive every day or whether it's a nice to have that they look at every once in a while. Well, I mean, in this era, it needs to be linked to something that can hopefully make decisions in a more automated way. You, 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 it's sort of like you need this decision rights around what data, what decisions can be made by and for data. Yeah. Like a decision right, you know, you could do a very lightweight version of that, like a version of the Bezos is type one, type two decisions, type one being very hard to undo and expensive. So a high undo cost literally high cost. And then there's the low undo costs. You can reverse it quickly. I, you know, days, weeks, hours, months, you define it yourself and the cost is low. So you can push the decision rights into the data or into the systems or into AI or some model that makes the decision for you. You know, it's, it's still directionally has to be things that actually drive the business. And if it's not making decisions and it's an insight that can't be acted on, I think in our, in our time, this chapter, this kind of human plus AI chapter the value of the concept of data is, is going to collapse very quickly without the capability to make decisions on, on, on an insightful basis, on an automated basis. And I think those rights are an interesting way to think about its ability to be activated. Yeah, very cool. So when it comes to data products versus like traditional products, generally, even for traditional software products, you've got this mix of technology skill set and business skill set you know, the typical is the, you know, the founder and the CTO, right? Who are, one is working more technically and one is working more on the business, but in, in businesses also, you've got the mix of the, the business leader and the technical, the technical side of things. I find that for, and there's always a disconnect where the technical person doesn't needs to learn more about the business and the business person needs to learn more about the tech and navigating that is, can sometimes be challenging. I find with data, it's like the harder version of that problem because the business people generally know even less about how data works than about how traditional software works. I, th- I find that I find that data people know just as much, probably more than than software engineers about how to interface with data people. But like the gap can sometimes feel enormous. What are some of the best practices that you've seen around how to navigate that disconnect? What are some of the ways that, because like, I find that as opposed to the traditional software, data people actually do need to be more involved in the business because it hinges on the data. Well, I think there's a number of ways to think about that. I mean, one is having run inside and outside sales teams for, you know, my own 
what one company that was relatively sophisticated data company. You need really, really, really good biz ops people. And I actually think this is a very important evolution. I mean, if you look at companies like Palantir, who are AI infrastructure companies, and they are a co-elevating platform for lots of our government and other places, they really are like a service-enabled platform company. And they're very sticky. They're very expensive, but they're sticky in a sense. They're bringing in the human and machine symbiosis that is driving insights that have are very consequential, right? So that there's the, the, not only can the systems not really be democratized because they're hard to build, but also it's a, also equally so a talent arms race. And I think that if you you provide yeah an upskill and train biz ops to really leverage systems in a way that drives business results, you're, you can build a whole company. I'm not sure, you know, you can decouple those in a lot of ways. I, I think it's, you can you can go in and have the best software in the world and embed it in a company and have really mediocre, bizarre people who don't know how to translate or use it. And you're going to get us, you're not going to have a positive result for the company. So I, I think there's a lot of evolution around the, the bias towards not scaling services, which is a mistake with complex data challenges. So the first thing is, is I would simply provide them the talent and I would try to create a talent capability that would up-level an organization. One, that's number one. The second one is I think I would try, I mean, almost build maybe with the same people But some sort of doctrine as a behavior inside the company that really prosecutes or data. So, for example, like the doctrine of wise would be an example of this. Again, I'm really just making this up, but it's more of a it's just a thought experiment, which is we we are we have we have a five Y test that we drive to. It's our like six sigma nine nines like. We don't, if we can't answer five whys for every business data decision, data, data, in data driven business decision, we don't make it. So what that's doing is, is putting incredible compression on the number behind the number behind the number behind the number. And I think that, that how you model that, how you stack it, how you contain it, how it, you support it. If it's going to be a high consequence type one territory decision, you have to have some standard of of investigation and conviction around it that changes the company. And if, conversely or inversely is the software has to be able to do that, right? And if it can't, we can't really solve high consequence business decisions. So I think like, you know, it's sort of, you know, doctrine is a really powerful idea because like most people don't know what to do. If you're like, you know, your your company needs to have data integrity and they're like, well, that's, what does that even mean? Like, you know, like if you're in the military doctrine is like, you know, what do you do in a battlefield in a, in a, in a incredibly, in a, in a hot conflict? Well, you move, shoot, communicate. You don't even have to think you just move, shoot, communicate because that's going to keep you alive, keep you together and, and suppress, right? That's the very first thing you do is the only thing you do until you get to safety, right? You know, instinctively because it's doctrine, it's not, do this, follow this rule, be this to each other. You instinct. So it's changing the instinct. So, you know, you're living it out. So, or like, you know, Salman, you, you, you're, you, you have a lot of, you have a, how do I know Salman is a, a, a high integrity person? Like what's the doctrine of a high integrity for Salman? Well, what would Salman's mother think would be the answer to that question? Like that's a doctrine. Like you could tell me all about your life. If you answer that one question, you would have doctrine on how to measure that. So like having doctrine helps transform your understanding of, can you believe something? Is it valuable? And maybe the five whys is that type of doctrine type stress. So you need, sorry, go back full scale because I talked a lot here is you need people and machine symbiosis in a way that large companies can't do. And we need to bring it and create the capability so they can leverage the tool so that there's doctrine to get value out of it. And it's because it can answer the five whys of any dimensional leader around that business decision because the software can support it and we know the question to ask. Like, that's a pretty high bar of a painkiller type of application that no one no one would ever get rid of if it passes that bar. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
it definitely does make sense, especially having lived through it in so many cases. And I, I've got a couple of interesting points to that. Number one, it's funny that you say that about sort of the symbiosis between software and people. You know, that, that, that I, I sort of independently came to that at Delivery Layer, where actually I can't, like, there are some tools that you can sell with product-led growth and you can sell with someone that just puts a credit card in and signs up and totally uses it themselves. But what I recognized very, very early on with Delivery Layer was that there's zero usage of this unless there is heavy involvement in getting customers onboarded, built out on the platform. And only then suddenly is there this disproportional a disproportional result. But if you expect that there's going to be no sort of services or no sort of heavy work involved in getting people across the line to value, then it's never going to work. And I agree with you that the world of startup companies needs to evolve. I think that in some ways that model doesn't fit what VC funds are exactly looking for for return. And, and it's understandable why. There's a certain category of companies that like there's such a market need and it's easy to buy. And like they kind of just like get sucked like there's a vacuum up to a hundred million in revenue. And for a VC, it's understandable why you would want to invest in those businesses when you're looking for return exponential returns in short time horizons. But I think for the businesses that it does make sense that they can eventually grow large, but they're going to grow more slowly and it's going to be more people involved and it might only be, you know, 50%, 50% margins instead of a hundred percent or 95% margins. Like there are a lot of big businesses there that don't fit that archetype. And I think the funding has influenced the company creation around where technology services companies tie in together slash most of the most of the big technology companies that I know in the data space have a lot of services that happen they just say it doesn't happen in their company they have integration partners so it's super interesting it's super interesting being on the other side of that just as a, a comment on the way that companies get built nowadays I mean listen the the God metric of a company needs to be the customer. Yes. Not the investor. And yes. the reality is like 100%. Prob- you know, problems don't choose founders. So, so founders don't often choose the founders. The problem chooses them. Yes. And you got to solve it. Yes. If your business just happens to be something that can scale indefinitely on an unbound return. Lucky you. Yes. It just doesn't happen that often. And if it doesn't, that's also perfectly fine. It's just what you're born to do. You should be in your dharma. You should be in your essence doing it, and then you should solve it. And over time, you hopefully there's aspects of the business that get so laborsome, you additionally solve those things, and it becomes less labor and scales. Like that's also perfectly fine. Like and so, like I think this venture is as validator type view of the world is is a is a is a false promise to success. It sucks up a lot of attention. I've raised tens of millions of venture from the best VCs in the world. And I've also bootstrapped to tens of millions of revenue and had exits. And the reason why I did those two things, because one is, you know, you get fairly good at doing these things. You're kind of like, do I really need capital? You do if you have an unbounded return in front of you. If it's not an unbounded return and you're allergic to board meetings and all of the time it takes to manage the capital, don't take capital because it's there to scale you. And those, there's some good quality. I mean, I have very close friends who are wonderful VCs who I, I love, and they've created a lot of value for me in my learning. But also, there's times where I'm just like, I just need to put my head down and solve the problem. Yeah. And if I need VC, I'll get back to them because it's so successful to be crazy not to invest in it. And most often, but the thing you should never lose sight is solve the problem. Yes. Yes. And, and so, like, David, if it doesn't matter if it takes, if it's low margin, high margin. Like, yeah, in the long term it does, but like not in the first couple of years where you figure out the business. Yeah, you will solve those reasons if you're solving the problem. The human machine aspect to it, it's basically, you know, you're kind of a failure until you're not. You're trying to take take an idea or a company that's dead and making it undead. Yes. Whatever it takes. Yes. And if that takes something that's not venture fundable, who cares? Yeah. As long as it's undead and it's scaling 
to solve the problem in a way that dominates your attention and what you care about. And ultimately you think it's worth worthy of your time. That's it. Like David, well, well said, well said. (laughs) I have a very, very deep like connection to that statement. Like it hits very deep. And then this, well, the other, just to po- throw one more lens yeah. on this, because is, is that in doing so, in doing that job of, of creating something, a solution that needs the world and what leads you, your North Star, that problem, as opposed to the money, you also have to recognize for your, your ability to make unbiased, commercially true based decisions means you have to believe that you are more than your company. It's just a company. You have to be able to set, step back and look at it and allow it to become whatever it's supposed to become. Because if you dominate the mind of the company, the people, et cetera, you're more likely to fail because you're not able to see all the commercial truth because you have one truth that you're going to crush the company around. And that happens rarely. It works. But when you back up and consider I'm more than the company, I'm trying to solve this need in the world in whatever version, I am equally have to accept that it's likely to fail, quite likely to fail, as it is to be quite likely to be successful. And as a result of that, all the options need to be available to me. I need a conspiracy of the willing, of the people, the ideas, and the customers to say, I love Solomon's love of this need, and we're going to solve it together, as opposed to, this is my vision, and it's right, and I'm going to drive this thing to the moon. That almost never happens. Yeah. There's a humility that helps you separate and release and surrender to the, your ability to see and solve the need and have it scale. Yeah. And it, it, it's really interesting because my the first time I started a company, I had that thing that didn't ever work, right? That like, this is the vision, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, you, I'm just going to will it into existence with the depth, yeah, totally with the depth totally of my hard work and brilliance on this issue. Meanwhile, as you said, the commercial reality of the world said, you know, what is it? Man plans and God laughs, right? And so... Well, I'm going to send you a video attached to this podcast of, a, of another podcast I did where I told a story about this breaking moment I had that was got me through this truth and really changed my view of like it's forever, but we don't get to today, but you could, have, you could have amend it with that outside story. It's pretty good. I think I know which story you're talking about because I saw that podcast. So I'm going to tell everybody that's listening to this that you're in for a treat on that one. But, you know, it's interesting. I think that this gets to many data products also, because not even just starting a company like like I, w- I was leading a really big transformation project at a previous company. And we had done an acquisition. We had like, there was a lot of push behind this thing. And it was sort of transforming a business that was a substantial business. Like there's a lot of revenue behind it. And there were real moments there that it looked like the whole thing was going to get shut down. Like the whole thing, like kit and caboodle. And then you know, I was leading a sports business during COVID when sports weren't happening, right? And there were moments there when when it looked like the whole thing was not going to be there anymore, right? And all of those times per like in my business career that I have sort of faced the abyss of is this thing not going to work out? can't even compare slightly to the feeling that I have in that same way around some of the stuff that's gone on with like my kids, which is so interesting for me where it's like, you know, cause I've talked about this before. Like when people say, why did you start delivery layer? Part of it is because I like really connect to the problem and I'm like deeply passionate about it. And I think that like it's something that's needed in the industry and it helps the industry be more connected to business and drives revenue. Like there's a like, and I came up with a good way of doing like there's a lot there. But like that was true also a couple of years before I started delivery layer. And the thing that happened other than that was stuff going on with my family that made it just not reasonable for me to start a company. And so it's interesting, like it's interesting what you say. I don't know how this podcast kind of turned into a halfway therapy session, but I think that you're very right. And I think for data people that are 
that are listening to this, you're, you, you're probably going to face some very challenging situations as a data person because data work is this, data work is not well defined. And it's impossible to define it well because your goal is essentially to help your business, right? That's what, and, and what, what does helping your business mean? Well, anybody can decide what that means at any point and it can scale up and scale down and there's vague requirements and, and stakeholders that, that, that don't know what they need. And sometimes there's a lot of effort and money and focus that gets put on data. And even if you do a reasonable or great job, some people might not even be able to recognize that. And like data work is, it doesn't have a clear def- like metric like sales, where if you're a, a chief revenue officer, you've got a number. If you hit the number, you did a great job, good job. If you miss the number, very, very bad, right? Data doesn't have the same thing. And uh, so let me, let me challenge that. Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to completely drop the entire philosophical rabbit hole we're going down because I have one more thing I want to say about that. But let me come back to that. But I think that, again, these are non-technical provocations. Yeah, 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 you, go. You should replace, again, and I know I'm sure there's some brilliant, brilliant engineers and listening to this who are going to cringe when I do this. But I think it's a really important provocation, which is I think you should set down the name and the word data and you should replace it with the word answer. It's very simple. It's like, did we or did we not get the answer? Now, you can improve the question, but that is of the of the atoms that produce the data that produce the like that is that really is the is the god metric in my view. And so however you roll it up, compact it, visualize it, serious it, automate, et cetera, is it the answer? Right? And it, that could be an answer that solved the problem in its entirety. It could be the answer to the question. But reframing changes the notion of it's something's value. And I think having a higher fidelity, higher one or zero on the oasis, as I said before, of data is and the existentialism around data, it, it needs to get from the theoretical to the applied physics. And the applied physics of data is the answer. So now that's, a, again... It's not a complete answer, but it is a provocation. And then secondly, going back to your philosophical question, I want to circle back to this, which is, well, I wrote, when I wrote this book called The Startup Playbook, I asked the founder of LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman, who wrote the foreword of the book, I said, to the degree that you count all the billions in the bank, which he has, right, how much would you accredit that to good fortune, timing, and luck, things you don't control? And his answer was 80%. And it's really important to remember, like, when you're successful, it has most often nothing to do with you. You're there when it happens. I was solving this problem for years and all of a sudden AI showed up or 4% capital, the Fed showed up and everyone's transforming their back office. Like, like you're, as, you're good, but you're not that good. And I'm not that good. So I've been on the right side, the wrong side of that. So you're never really as bad as you feel because of those outside forces when they're working against you. And you should never really feel as good as you feel when it's working for you because you we're not that talented, right? Like no matter what. So the, the point is like we, we control a lot of things. We don't really control the things we think we control. And it's a very humbling reality when you're building a company. And I, I think there's a physics to, there's a natural physics to creating companies, which is like, it typically takes seven years and a blink of death moment before you figure the biggest business out. No matter how good you are, it's just that Gladwellian 10,000 hours of work and knowledge obsession and the acute pain of failure that helps you focus on the thing that gets you out and becomes the business. And so we can be as optimistic as we want and raise money and stuff, but you inevitably get to a point where it has to work and you're going to make it work because you can see the truth for itself. So hold that aside. I want to, you know, it's a, it's an important way to put a but, sort of bow on what you were talking about, the sort of philosophical conversation we're having but I want to get back to the provocation, which is, is that the bar and the reframing of the value of data needs to be thought about differently in a way that matters to people who are actually paying for it. I think the answer, as opposed to the word data, might be a way to think about that. Yeah, I, I think it's a good provocation. I think there's so many, like any big picture generalizations are, right? There's so many things that go into that. To me, I, where, where I've seen the answer, I, I've kind of said it another way, like the impact, right? Like where you can, in my experience, I because I've been on the other side many times, 
you can tell when people across the business are saying, oh my gosh, this person is like, we couldn't live without them. One of the cool things about data, similar to a business or a startup, is that the impact of what you can have is kind of uncapped. If you come up with an insight or with a strategy or with a business case behind how in the data you've noticed something and, hey, marketing, look at this thing in the data. If we leverage this, we could, we could make an extra you know, $50, $100 million a year. Or product, look at this usage pattern. Right. Look at look at these types of customers that are doing this type of thing. Like what would it what would it mean if we doubled down on that or launched this ancillary product that or these new features that could that could blow things up? Right. There's no cap to what you can bring to the table. And I think that's one of the things that offsets the fact that supporting senior stakeholders, you're all, there's always a challenge because people want that answer. They want data to say, what's the answer? Let's do it. Whereas in the real world, data says, well, 70% of the evidence is this way and 30% of the evidence can point this way. And it's unclear what's going to happen in the future. And that is an answer, but it's an answer that sometimes people will struggle with in in terms of how to navigate those situations. So that to me is that like the answer, I think, I think it it, it corresponds to the impact. And, and I like that. And I I like back to the back, back to what you were saying before we got into some of the philosophical tangents. I like that five whys. Some data people have started to talk about like metric trees. It's like, we are changing this. Well, what does that matter? Well, it means it changes this. Why does that matter? Well, it changes this. And why does that matter? Well, because that, changes the trajectory of the business or that it like, and, and I've always said that the best data people that I've ever worked with have a great mental model for how the business works and how the industry works and how different levers or different data things that you can identify will have different impact. Because if you don't know the business and you don't know the industry, you could look at product data all day. You're never going to be able to identify, oh, this data is interesting because it has this implication for what we can do. And I think that five whys really ties into the idea of having a strong mental model. And I think that's, that's crucial. I love it. We cannot go through a show like this in today's day and age in 2023, talking about companies being started or big companies starting things without talking about Gen AI. That's the thing. People exactly do go shot. do your I'm shot. Like, yeah. yeah. Do your shot, like <laughs> fill out your bingo board, whatever you're doing. Yes. You, you, I imagine are seeing it very much like front and center in the work that you do to help companies that are doing the next big yeah. thing for many companies that next big thing is gen ai so like what what do you think about this like and how has that experience been and what have you seen companies doing smart and what have you seen companies doing not so smart yeah so i just so again i want to caveat the saying is like i i am as new to this space as everyone else. I do have, I'm very fortunate to have a front row seat to a lot of it on the application side and not the theoretical at the applied side. So the boundary of, of, of insight here really is on the application side, right? So just I want to over communicate that, but on the front row seat side of this stuff, I, you know, Accenture is one of the biggest developers in the world on the applied side. You know, we have 60,000 people doing this and Bionic, which was acquired the growth OS, which is our model is now central to this. And when you think about it from, and, and also I've, I've looked at a lot of companies in the space who've built really powerful tools that have taken a lot of biological and analog experiences or, or efforts and made them a hundred times better in one one hundredth of the speed. But the IQ of that work and the, the, insight or synthesis of it relative to the problem is actually quite low. So it's sort of like, I think I heard this best where someone was like, well, you know, you know, AI or human plus AI and the tools will make the average organization go from an IQ of 95 to like 115 to 120 or higher, maybe over time, you know, if it gets better and better at the sort of, you know, really proprietary LMs. But, you know, and that's going to make the smart people feel like a little less smart. And we just probably need fewer Baker scholars in the whole whole institution because 
they're going to, there's going to be a lot of high level work with the application is going to make the whole organization smarter so they can do more work faster and this sort of stuff. So big productivity swing, not necessarily a big intellectual swing, right? So, you know, I, what you hoped has happened is for a lot of companies, they're going to have this lead to gold moment where, you know, they're very high resources, low margin, and all of a sudden they have probably lower resources, but much higher margin because their their intellect and the skill and capability organization is doubled overnight. And, and, and what you hope happens is that they start solving harder and harder problems as a result of that. Now, not all companies are going to do that because they're limited in the way they think or they're limited in how they view growth. They really like creating a gusher of cash out of an old company. There's all, all sorts of reasons why that might not happen. But if it does happen, we'll move to an era where either by time or resources, we'll start to retire old problems and needs on autopilot in a lot of ways. And we'll start moving up the chain of difficulty across a lot of industries that we just couldn't get to because we had all these like albatross problems we were solving that now can fly. Right. So I like that. That's really what I feel is going to happen. It, but it is going to affect a lot of highbrow expensive things in the short term, because a lot of the initial upfront ideation, the early initial upfront validation work, market research, whole design, all these play things are going to be brought and enabled in house. So if you don't have enabling tools and services that can provide the sort of like capability to do this, and you're just providing the brains that, and this is why I think largely Accenture wins is because they have both. This is the machine, human machine symbiosis. If you're just the human and the earn an intellectual arms race, you're in trouble. That's my point of view. I'm not speaking for the company at all. In fact, I, I, I'm not allowed to speak for, for the company. I'm just saying I'm taking a macro industry view of this from my perspective. So I just finished returning from TED AI, which is a little mini exclusive micro conference from TED last or two weeks ago. And I left feeling uh, several feelings, <laughs> but the predominant ones are the, let's say the two dominant ones were one, the velocity of the speed of this industry and its impact. I don't think people really can wrap their heads around. You think you understand exponential until you see it and you're like, oh my God, like now I know what exponential is. It's kind of the opposite of Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises with the protagonist when he asked him, like, Michael, when he, how'd you go bankrupt? And he said, really slowly, then all at once. That's what's really is happening. And you're seeing across every industry. It's, it's happening at a day level, mRNA vaccines. You're seeing that in the mining of asteroids. We're seeing this, like, you know, if you just look at the volume of what SpaceX has done and Starlink has done the last 18 months alone, that's because these systems exist together in a way you couldn't have human calculations to even understand them. They're leapfrogging. So the rate of change is pure hard for companies to wrap their head around. So those are really exciting things. The one is, is that it's exponential is real. It was at the edges and now it's gone mainstream and we need to recognize that. And the second thing is, is that there is very low to no regulatory framework around the changes coming. So like, I think that's happening in Europe. We just signed some to law last week with Biden, which I think is really wise. You know, when you understand general intelligence and it was a decade ago or it's supposed to be 25 years out and it's 10 years out. Now it's supposed to be 2028, 20, 2031. 20, Super intelligence really terrifies me and it should you. So a lot of what we're talking about set in motion with some of these tools that a compute layer, a chip layer, are going to be really, it's going to change all of our lives. So I want to be out in front of it, but it's coming much faster than people realize. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we're certainly in like another internet moment, right? Where if you, if you think about the sort of early age of the internet, it, I lived through it. it was my, I graduated college in 96. It was my first job. It was my first startup when I was 21. Yeah. I'm older than you. A lot older than you, <laughs> fifty now. You have the ten, the ten years, the ten year shift, right? And so, within that, because I remember, I, you know, it's so funny. I remember the the early days for me. I was in like seventh grade when like we got AOL, right? And 
I remember the first, there was this television show that I loved. And I remember the first thing that I did was try to like search for all of the episodes of the television show, because obviously why wouldn't they just put that on the internet? Like that was sort of where my head went. It wasn't there. Right. And then it wasn't until like 15 years later, probably I was like, you know what? I bet I could just go on the internet and get every episode of this television show that I thought was like it, it was Hogan's Heroes when I was like it was it, they used to oh, it, it was an old school show that they only used to show reruns every once in a while. I was like, how great would it be if I could just watch it nonstop on this new AOL thing? And and I at some point many years later, I just looked at it and I looked up Hogan's Heroes and I was like, oh yeah, I could just download every episode. I know. And I think AI is going to be pretty similar. It's it's like there's a lot of different ways that it can change things and I think it'll sort of play out like at a it like a you know it, it, at a, at a pretty quick rate and it's it'll be it'll be it'll be an exciting decade to see how things actually do change. Yeah, I mean, the, the main like sort of like Disruption to mainstream adoption of the internet, or most technologies used to be 20 years. I think this one's probably going to be one third the time, is my guess. That's, my, that, that's how I really feel. I, and then, so I like it's, it's a very sobering but exciting look at it. And I'm trying to be trying to be in it to the degree I can, or, you know, be part of solving problems that leverage it since I can't be really in it. Like you got to be really technically strong to be contributing to it, but you can leverage it. And I'm, fascinated by how to do that. Yeah. It's I've I've got a lot to say on that. I think it with AI stuff cuz I've talked to also companies who are like we want to hire some people that can work with AI. And it's like do we hire data people and like which data people are the right data people to hire. And in in some in some ways we're actually kind of back in the back in the days of like hire your friend's kid in high school who's tinkering around with stuff in the garage because the people that are like the experts in getting the most value out of AI aren't necessarily the data people who are the most experienced in the like development of the foundational AI technologies and it's it's interesting to see the split there as sort of two they obviously have some connection but but the the people who are figuring out how to scale and use ai for various different business purposes aren't necessarily like they're kind of hacking it together they're not yeah the horizontal skills this is where I mean, listen, a vertical skilled genius is going to help create the foundational layers of it for sure. That's what they spend the time. But for everyone else, the very few who are not that, it's going to be horizontal thinkers. Yeah. Like literally, you're going to be, I mean, I almost would want to have someone who's like a philosophy major with an, you know, minor in like E or something, you know, electrical engineer or an E person who's also like in a band or a writer or something where they know language, but they also understand physics. They understand computer science. They understand, you know, the productization, enough ME quality, the things of how things are built. Like it's probably one of the best degrees that you could possibly get with, if you put all the hard candy shell of language around it in some form in this era, I think. That's super interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought that like data, one of the best things that I love about data work is how multifaceted it is. And yeah, in in yeah. some elements of data work, you need real depth to like come up with new algorithms and new foundational technologies, which I also completely do not have. But that commercialization of data and working with stakeholders, internal and external, really does require a very broad skill set. I mean, kind of similar to you know, the same way that as a founder, you have to deal with everything. You don't just get to, I mean, you, you hire people who are experts, but at the same time, you kind of need to, you kind of need to know a little bit about everything. And. Amusingly, I've seen this happen many times where, you know, the CEO of a really big company will be like, we're going to be in the software business and they're going to build a SaaS division, or we're going to be in this, whatever, but they're like, we're going to build a, like a digital P and L. You're like, no, no, no. you like, you're a digital company. Like it's in the genetics. It's a Prometheus moment. Like 
no, you're an AI company, enabled company. You're not going to build an AI division or a SaaS. They're like, no, no, it's not even you. It's like, it's being the nature of how they work, you know? It's interesting because as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, I'm going to keep pushing you on this as we talk, not only today, but going forward about, about this reframing data to answers. Because I, yeah. know, I know you dislike that. You like to impact. But I actually think it might be possible with AI. If you think about, like, what is what is a delivery layer doing? It should be delivering that, right? And so it can be a higher bar, a higher bar we're comfortable from. It could be a higher bar. It, maybe there's a way to contextualize it around conviction or confidence in the, in, the, in the answer, like directional confidence, directional conviction, because our, we're able to deliver in the layers answers. Like there, there's some, some way to, with AI that allows us, I think, in a past that we, it's not just simply organizing it anymore and connecting it and synthesizing it. It's more about getting, gaining conviction and confidence from the business decisions we make of and from it. Yeah, uh, and I will take that answers and actually say that it is very reasonable because you do need to get to the answer, right? Or you need to get to an answer eventually, and no decision is an answer, right? Or confidence in the answer, conviction answer, or it's how is the second order momentum around it influencing our belief that we have it or not have it? You know? Yeah. A hundred percent. And so, so the bar is the right bar because if you don't use data to get an answer, then you haven't used it. Right. I agree. And it hasn't been valuable. I think there are many intermediate steps that happen before that ultimate answer. But if you, if you don't get to the answer, then you, you haven't done anything. So. Yeah, I think this is where coming full circle on what 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 moment are we with in AI? I'm, I'm trying to move it into the delivery layer context. I think AI will enable that, empower that question, that answer, that fear of the answer bar, that God metric to be contextually or convictionally true in a way that we couldn't before. Cool. Okay, great. Well, David, thank you so much for joining joining this episode. It was, I mean, when I started this podcast, a good chunk of it was to have an excuse to have really amazing conversations that maybe we only used to have in private and to sort of like share them with the world and, and take some of the, the, the insights and the smart people that I've learned from along the way and give them a platform so that other people can also benefit. And I, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I really appreciate you and the sort of um, guidance that you've given me over the years, as well as just the the general positivity and cool things that you bring out to the world. So thank you so much. If people want to follow along with what you're doing, like where should they follow you? Well, let me. So the easiest way is probably LinkedIn. So David S. Kidder. But I also have like a website, David S. Kidder dot com and on Twitter is basically David has carried everywhere, but I want to over communicate to you. Like I all, when we first met at Bionic, I always thought you had at a intellect and personal level, but an energy and joy and innate <clears throat> happiness in the work that was very unusual. And when you go and build things in the world, you would take on hard problems and you're successful. It's because not just because you're good, it's because everybody wants to see you win. And that those conditions have to be true for you to have any success. The outside forces, but like the marketplace, the people and the customers and clients that use you and listen to you and leverage you have to really love you and have to really love the thing you care about and follow you and equally value it. And I think you have that possibility in you. And I think the people want to see you succeed in that way because of who you are. And I hope you receive it because I think you've, you've always been very special to me. And I think the rest of the world is discovering that truth. All right. Well, David, thank you so much. That's very kind words. And thank you for being on the episode. And I will talk to you soon.